the funniest thing when you write a book? I have no idea that I wrote that. <laughs> it was so many years ago. It's always interesting to hear when somebody quotes you and you go, did I really say that? Uh, so we, we don't have a lot of time because I know everybody's hungry, but I, but I want to share with you uh, a few thoughts about things I don't think we discussed in much detail this morning. And that's about language and about the power of language and the difference in how language looks when it's talked about a man and a woman. So when Hillary Clinton was first beginning her run for the presidency, she was giving a speech in upstate New York and she had the flu. She had a really bad case of the flu. And as the speech was ending, she was sort of wobbling a little and one of her staffers pushed a chair up behind her and she pretty much flopped in the chair. And the next morning, the big headlines in the New York Times, Mrs. Clinton faints. And I thought, isn't that interesting? She lost all of her titles, she became Mrs. Clinton, and faints, not a very powerful word. Um, somehow the faints makes me think of vapors and gone with the wind, uh, you know. And I thought, this woman's running for the presidency. If this had been a man, would they have said faints? I mean, does power faint? I doubt it. So I, I sort of thought about it and let, let it go for a while. And about six weeks later, Mike Krzyzewski, we've been talking about sports this morning. How many people know who Mike Krzyzewski is? A little. So one of the things I would tell all of you, it's not a bad idea to know a little bit about sports. You don't have to know a lot. Mike Krzyzewski is the co coach of the Duke University men's basketball game, one of the winningest coaches in US basketball history. Who was the winningest? We just had a discussion? OK, ladies, come on, let's be proud of it. All right, Pat Summit. So Krzyzewski was coaching at Cameron Stadium at Duke. This is about six or eight later, weeks after Mrs. Clinton. He had the same flu. And he got very wobbly. Somebody sort of pushed the chair up behind him, the bench, and he pretty much flopped down. Next day, all the sports pages around the country, big banner headlines, Coach K collapses. I thought, isn't that interesting? But when you think about it, power collapses. Presidents collapse. They don't faint. Very interesting when you look at the words. In our language, and in most languages, the words around power and accomplishment tend to be associated with male. And the words around being subordinate or being acted upon tend to be connected to females. OK, so faints means something happened to you. All right, collapsing is an active way of being. I mean, it's sort of interesting, but they're very different kind of words in terms of their actions. And so I began looking and seeing, well, wow, are there other places, are there real differences if the same exact thing happens? Is there a real difference in whether it happens to a man or it happens to a woman and how we talk about it? So I began looking at a lot of different places, and what I discovered was, the power words always seem to be attached to, to males, and the subordinate words tend to be attached to females. So our assumption is that he has the power, and we look at the words alone like power. If I ask a group of men if they like power, everybody in the room raises their hand because they're very happy with power. If I ask a group of women, it's very interesting. People sort of go halfway. Few people go like this, few people say nothing. And then somebody says, well, I like influence. And I'm no, ladies, the word's power. The <laughs> word's not influence. Uh, so what's the difference? Well, it's very, very interesting when you start to think about it. Is there a male and female definition that's different in these kind of words? So when you ask men, and all of this has been studied and restudied now, when you ask men and boys, they're clear, power is about being able to get something done. Power is about having the ability to, to win. When you talk to women, what you hear is power is much more about subjugation. Power means one person is up and another person is down. So with a lot of these words, we even have a different definition in our mind. Even 
even from what the dictionary says. So I started an experiment. I'm going to make all of you work this morning, OK? I have a young man and a young woman. They both work for me, let's say, about 12 years. Um, they're in their late 30s, maybe early 40s. And I have a fairly flat organization. And there's really not a place for them to grow to the next place. And I know one of the tips for all of you is that if you're a really good leader, part of your job is to grow good people and then move them on so that they can keep growing, not to hide them and keep them at some place because they're so good at it. So they both have come to me and said they're looking for new jobs. And would I be a reference for them? And of course, I say yes. So they're both excellent employees, very similar and all the rest. Let's take the young lady first. What are the first three words I say about her when I write a reference? Anybody got an idea? What's the first word? She is hardworking. Thank you very much. So this has been studied, restudied, and studied again. And number one on the female list is hardworking. What's number two? Dependable, OK, dependable, loyal, OK? That, that's number three on the list, OK? What do you think is next? Bud? Okay. Smart, so very interesting. Somebody said smart. People always say smart or intelligent on the female list. Interestingly enough, that's number four on the female list. Now, we think that's nice. Guess where it is on the male list? Right, like 97. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's really not good news. The reason it's so far down on the male list is the gender schema assumption in our society is that a male is competent at the office or in business until he proves his incompetence. The female is incompetent until she proves her competence. So you need to establish that she is smart or intelligent. With him, it's an assumption. Now, the truth is, that's about what part of the society we dominate. Because if you look at our personal lives, if you see a man and a baby in a diaper, the gender assumption is incompetence till he proves his competence. And if you see a young woman in the same situation, the assumption is competence. So this is about the part of the world we dominate. OK, so she's hardworking, dedicated, and loyal. Anybody got another guess? OK, so somebody said nice. OK, so literally on the female list, <clears throat> nice is number five. OK, I actually want to be nice. I am nice. But it's not really the business words you want in your reference. OK, so then the other one I heard somebody over there say is collaborative. Team player collaborative. OK, so she is hardworking, loyal, dedicated, devoted. <laughs> Collaborative, team player, nice and smart. Sounds just like my golden retriever. <laughs> right? Great description, all right? Now let's take the male list. OK? What's the first thing we say? He's got what? Drive. All right, drive, ambition, go getter, that's number three. What's number one? A leader, thank you. Somebody over here, I can't see with all the lights. Right, he has leadership potential. Anybody got a guess of what the other one is? Number two is strategic. OK, so he has leadership potential. He's, he's strategic, and he's a go-getter. Who got the job? OK, so isn't that interesting? Now, I said that both of these people I liked equally. They were equally competent. They did an equally good job for me. Why didn't we use the same words? Really important thing for us all to think about. So we don't have a lot of time this morning, but one of the things I want to suggest to all of you is that the brand you have are the three words people say about you when you're not in the room. And you need to make sure that those three words match where you want to go and how you want to present yourself. And you can determine what those three words are by the way you talk about yourself, 
by the way you get other people to talk about you. So one of the things that's happened with women in our society is they've fallen in love with being hardworking. That seems to be the wonderful word. What does hard work get you? So, <laughs> so ladies, if everybody, I have never stood in front of an audience in my life where every woman in the audience didn't understand that what hard work gets you is more work. So why, when we talk about how complex our lives are, when we talk about all of the different multitasking things women need to do in their lives, why would you set yourself up as hardworking? When it's 5.30 and somebody needs to rerun the budget numbers, do they ask the hard worker or the go-getter? Okay? So you don't get to complain about how hard you have to work if that's the way you set yourself up. <laughs>